Welcome to the Geffen Contemporary at MoCA. Thank you very much for joining us today for the third panel in the Art for Earth's Sake series. My name is Livia Mandel, and I've had the pleasure of working alongside my colleague, Frances Anderton, and the team at MoCA to produce this program. Art for Earth's Sake is part of the year-long initiatives and programs guided by the work of MOCA's Environmental Council, which was founded in 2020 as the first sustainability council at a major arts museum in the United States. The series you'll see today is made possible by the Manitou Fund. Over the course of five public discussions, Art for Earth's Sake has been exploring the topic of the art world and its environmental footprint. Invited artists, academics, activists, and industry insiders consider what the art world is doing and can do in the future to leverage its outsized cultural influence to help flight, fight the climate crisis, both operationally and culturally. We are delving into the topics ranging from greening art facilities and art fairs, reckoning with environmental justice, and considering whether holograms of art might be the way to keep art local. Finally, the program considers the impact of the climate crisis on artistic expression itself. And that is exactly what we will be exploring in today's panel, which is entitled, The Medium is the Message, Clean Art Making from Earth to Outer Space. Historically, the medium or materials used in art making were typically only a means or tool to create art, and were often toxic to the artist and the environment itself. Think spray paints and glazes, glues and fixatives, for example. So today we will hear from individuals who consider the materials themselves as part of the artistic narrative to carry an environmental message. You will hear from artist Lily Kwong, whose lovely installations made of plant materials comment on our relationship with the natural world. At the other end of the spectrum, quite literally, you will hear from artist Julia Christensen, who protests e-waste and the upgrade culture through a fascinating conceptual spaceship that flies light years away. We are also delighted to welcome Elizabeth Kaur, Director of Art Partnerships at the Natural Resources Defense Council, who creates projects that fuse art and advocacy. Today, we are eager to know how our guest's work manifests our theme. The medium is the message. Is didactic art also good art? And how effective is its environmental message? The conversation will be moderated by researcher and writer Jason E. C. Wright, founder and director of Burnt Siena Research Society. After the conversation, we will have the pleasure of enjoying a short and very special performance by musician Modern Biology. I don't want to give too much away, but suffice it to say, it involves plants and something called biosonifying. And after that, we will have time to take any questions you might have. And now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Lily, Julia, Elizabeth, and Jason to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Good. We're going to try this again. I know some of you went to public school. Somebody did. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? All right, there we go. Very good, very good, very good. Welcome. Um, my name is Jason E.C. Wright. I am founder and director at Burnt Siena Research Society. Uh, we do a lot of really fun things, but the biggest thing is making sure that people have access to design thinking and art books as references. And speaking of references, I have three very esteemed people here that are doing really wonderful things in the space of art and land and understanding how to push a conversation forward using their medium as the message for it. I uh, would like to start by acknowledging that we are here today on unceded lands of the Tongva, and we'd like to acknowledge that. We invite everyone to consider whose lands that you're on, uh, wherever you are, but also being grateful for being able to be here and being in this conversation. I um, have a few notes throughout here that I'll be reading from my phone, but the start is, this is a conversation about the medium being the message, right? And so when we talk about creating art, a lot of times we think about the tools that are used just as something to be thrown away or, I don't know, not considered in the art making process, but there's a whole new wave of artists that are considering ways to do that and other people working adjacent to the art world. So we have to my right, my left, sorry, stage right, um, Julia Christensen, Lily Kwong, Elizabeth Kaur, uh, I'd like to start with Lily, actually. 
I want to let you all introduce yourselves as far as your sure. background on where you kind of got into these projects that uh, we see here on these screens. So I think you have a few, um, yeah. Lily, from... Oh, nope, sorry, I missed it. Sorry, I thought I tried to catch it. Um, but I know that you have a few that are of note, but just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk sure. a bit more about how you started. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Lily Kwong. I'm the founder of Studio Lily Kwong, which is a next generation landscape design studio whose mission is to reconnect people to nature. And we mostly do that through large scale botanical art that supports really robust programming. And so hopefully, uh, some of our exhibitions will pop up on the slideshow, but we've worked uh, on the High Line, uh, Grand Central Station, done multiple exhibitions for Art Basel over the years, and um, my journey really started in the redwood trees. That's where I'm from. I grew, about, uh, grew, grew up about 10 minutes away from Muir Woods National Monument, and if any of you have ever been lucky enough to be there, these redwood trees are the tallest trees in the world. Many of them are 800 to 2,000 years old, and they're these incredible beings. They have this resonance, this presence that really was integrated through my ch entire childhood and education. And I think when I moved from Mill Valley to New York, I was struck, obviously, with the incredible contrast of going somewhere so wild into a different kind of urban wild and urban context. And so um, after studying urban planning and urban design, my mission became to reconnect people to the natural world and bring that sense of um, awesomeness, the kind of profound beauty of nature, the overwhelming uh, lessons uh, that we can learn from plant life and using that as an artistic medium to create these installations in urban cores. So that's a bit of my journey. And right. also, I apologize, my little baby is here and I think he's very confused about <laughs> why I'm on stage. So my lovely husband's gonna do his best. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. so, so these are pieces that we did in Grand Central Station. We built 15 foot tall mountains overnight. Um, and I just find playing with topography and mountainous forms and studying um, everything from fungi to tropical plants to orchids, um, really the plants themselves inform our approach to, to how we uh, put planting palettes together, how we develop our programming. I have a team of researchers, everyone from eco-futurists to industrial designers, botanists, horticulturalists. Um, my practice certainly, instead of taking it through a traditional landscape architecture approach, I've really gone to the plant people um, to understand how to work with m my medium. So that means nursery people I have an amazing person, Katie Tilford here from Theodore Payne Nursery. Um, if you don't know them, they're a fantastic resource for conservation. And the plants you see here that uh, Tarun's gonna play with is, is from their nursery. Um, but I've derived a lot of my knowledge base from working with nurseries like Theodore Payne, um, from New York Botanical Garden and Botanical Gardens uh, across the country, uh, urban farmers. My project manager and lead is someone who managed the Brooklyn Grange Farm for years, which is the largest urban farm in the country. Um, so my team's really comprised of, of people whose uh, first relationship is with the plant world. Right, and that speaks to, again, like using that as the medium to create that message of here's how we're all interconnected, here's how these things come together, but also there's an educational bent to it a bit. Yeah. Now, Julie, you're in that realm of educating and not just through the work that you do, but also through like the places that you teach. Would you talk a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and then also the project that uh, you're working on now, especially with that medium? Sure, is this on? Yes. Hi, um, thank you and thanks uh, everybody. Nice to meet you guys. Um, yeah, so my background is pretty varied. Uh, I have uh, dabbled in electronic music and installation and um, I write and have sort of a, a varied uh, art practice. Um, I'm also a professor at Oberlin College in Ohio, 
And um, I like teaching there because uh, it's kind of liberal arts to the max. So students are studying art and politics and science. And uh, so the work that they're making in art classes is very much uh, informed by that kind of fluidity. And, and I think that's really how I work uh, as well. So um, the, the project that uh, flashes by every now and then on these uh, screens um, is, is from a series of pieces and projects that I made over a number of years. Uh, the umbrella project is called Upgrade Available. And uh, my, my interest and sort of my driving questions in these uh, projects were about how we relate to um, uh, technology, especially after it obsolesces and we're not using it anymore. We have these really weird relationships with, uh, you know, technological stuff. We save right. our pictures, we save our documents, we, um, uh, you know, they, they assist us in many ways throughout, you know, throughout our days. Um, and then when we're done using them, uh, they still have this ghost of a presence uh, in our lives. And so right. I started to think about how um, we relate to technology in sort of our daily lives and uh, in our lifetimes and uh, looking at how institutions relate to technology over many lifetimes, you know, a cultural narrative that lasts for many human generations. And then I started working, um, talking to uh, scientists uh, who are, you know, space scientists and engineers thinking about technology on the very long term in the, the context of space missions that last for, you know, decades or potentially centuries. Um, and through that dialogue, I wound up working on this project uh, uh, called the Tree of Life that uh, will flash by here in a minute. I think it's, I think it's almost coming up. Almost coming. Um, and uh, through this project, we're trying to think about how to make trees uh, actually central to a technological system that will allow us to um, communicate with spacecraft over a very long time if we keep the trees themselves uh, healthy and happy. So right. um, so the idea is, uh, uh, here we come, almost. we're almost there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to kill time for this to come around. This is uh, some examples of your work. This is, which one was this? These, these are photographs that I took in, in India at an e-waste recycling uh, or processing uh, uh, market in, right. in Delhi. Um, I visited a number of corporate and uh, 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 informal e-waste processing centers in India. These are from uh, the archives at uh, LACMA at the, the up oh, here's our tree. Our, our first antenna tree. So I, I started to take pictures, um, you know, after I had taken these pictures of e-waste in India, I was, I was looking at uh, the archives at LACMA and thinking, you know, it's really the same stuff, you know, here in these boxes, <laughs> um, you know, that I just saw on the other side of the world in, in right. these e-waste piles and, you know, just kind of thinking about how context uh, creates capital and uh, what does that mean where trash is concerned. And we're going to talk a little bit more about um, the Space Song project in a little bit, but Lily, your work with plant life as a medium to convey that message and your work with um, Julia with e-waste and that being the medium of conveying the message of the planned obsolescence that we have with our technologies, both of you approaching that from an artistic sense. Elizabeth, you are working with artists almost as a way of like embedding yourself from an institution with artists versus the as artists working with an institution. Can you talk a little bit about yourself, your background with the NRDC, and a little bit about how you're working with artists uh, to use the medium of art as a way to extend the message about uh, what the NRDC does? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, my name's Elizabeth. I'm the Associate Director of Arts and Cultural Partnerships at NRDC. For those not familiar, NRDC is a 50 plus year old environmental advocacy organization. So that means my colleagues, 700, I work with 700 lawyers, scientists and other advocates. <laughs> and then there's me. Um, <laughs> and so uh, my role really is to sort of be a, a translator of the, 
the work that we're doing and to try to animate it in new ways for public audiences. Um, you know, we're trying to tell stories, build the environmental movement, and one way to do that is through the liberal arts, um, which is what my background was in. So when I started working at NRDC, it was sort of dismaying to me that this wall existed between the work that we were doing as an environmental organization, but the work that all of these incredible artists and writers were doing simultaneously. And, you know, as a college student, I had studied um, the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa and the role that artists played in that. And we all know that when you have a cultural movement or a social movement, artists are often the nucleus of those things. And so it felt very strange to me that from an environmental perspective, we had sort of separated those things. And so this is where I saw an opportunity to kind of step in. And so um, what I did, which was quite unconventional at the time, it was 2014, was set up an artist in residence program within a non-arts organization, within an environmental advocacy organization. And so some of the, this is actually the first project we ever did called Milkweed Dispersal Balloons. Um, this is a project that was informed by the litigation and advocacy work we were doing around pesticide use and pollinator decline. Um, and so this project was an open source art project created by Jenny Kendler, our first artist in residence, um, that traveled around the Midwest along the North American uh, monarch migratory route. And what people were asked to do was sort of participate in the project in this way where they became the agents of seed dispersal. So they were given a biodegradable balloon full of milkweed uh, which is a very tenacious plant and can sort of grow anywhere. And they were asked to take those back to their community and pop them, and in doing so, sort of disperse across this whole migratory path millions and millions of native milkweed seeds. And so what happened is, you know, we, we showed sort of how you can move from advocacy as, as a, a legal matter to something that can become sort of a social action, people as agents of change. And the idea was to sort of use the project as a way to inspire artists and audiences to want to become part of the movement and grow the movement. So this is a particularly heavy hitting project because it debuted in St. Louis, which is the world headquarters of Monsanto. And so, you know, it wasn't just a monarch food cart for fun, but we really, really wanted to make an impact with where we were doing this. And so we started there. And I think the ethos of the project also is about everyone sort of having the power to be a part of something. And so by giving away these balloons and creating the project as an open source project, we could help do that across the country. So it's been replicated now, I think over 50 times across the country, here in California too with native milkweed here. And in doing so has created critical habitat for important pollinators like monarchs. First of all, can we have a round of applause just for that in of itself? Like that's, that's really incredible. And it's interesting because it's almost like uh, digging the same tunnel from different sides, right? And at the core of all this is a level of advocacy, which I'm always going to advocate for people having a good time, just maybe <laughs> not right now. But the idea of being overwhelmed, right, with the realities of things that you're facing, whether it's the insurmountable amount of e-waste that goes out through upgrade culture or the consistent kind of disconnect from nature or even the disconnect of the legal system from caring about nature or arts and institutions. Each of you have found a way to use the work that you're doing to be an advocate for something, right? My question is, when did you realize you cared this deeply about something to kind of like raise that flag as, I really want to commit my work to furthering this message, whether it's heavy handed, whether it's kind of like more nuanced, like when did you realize that this was something like, oh, not only is this something I can do, but this is really important to me. Is there a, a thing that happened or an instance or an article or something that really triggered you to say, oh, there's this synergy here between my medium, like what I'm doing, and the message I want to put out, the things that I want to teach. Anybody? I don't know why they're all looking at me. <laughs> it's like, you've, you've been doing this the longest? Okay. Um, when, when I was a kid, I was that kid who loved like a good protest 
or like a good petition or a fight against the teachers. Like I really wanted to organize. So it does not surprise me to find myself all of these years later to, to be at essentially a public interest law firm where we're doing that. Um, but at the same time, you know, those are not my set of skills. Um, I, I do not have an analytical mind in the way that my colleagues do. Um, what I've always responded to as a person and a human is, is the visual and the tactile and the sort of experience, the unplanned experiences you can have both with nature but also with art. And so, you know, that's where I saw an opportunity. Um, at the same time, there was no job to do what I'm doing. And so um, it required a certain amount of creativity to commit yourself to a mission, which I really believed in, which was an environmental mission, and then try, try to find a way to kind of infuse my talents in support of that mission. And so I think, you know, as a result, we, we now have a fully integrated team where we do, we call it entertainment partnerships, and we do work with celebrities, artists, other cultural leaders, we work in Hollywood, and it's really this whole kind of rethinking of how you can deploy the tools of NRDC, those traditional tools of law, science, and advocacy in this new way in support of culture makers and culture producers. That's fantastic. Lily? Yeah, I, um, I shared a bit about my personal s story, abbreviated, but to kind of expand it out a little bit, um, I mentioned I grew up in the redwood trees and I moved to New York and just fell in love with culture and people and music and design and art. And I just, you know, in your late teens, early 20s, you're not very in tune with your needs or the rhythms of your body, at least I wasn't. So I didn't realize when I was feeling all these psychological stressors from being in the center of New York and hardly ever leaving, that anxiety, that exhaustion, that feeling of depletion, that uh, just constant sense of being exhausted, frankly. I didn't associate that with my need for the natural world or feeling disconnected from it. I went back to Columbia. I studied urban design and urban planning. I approached it from a theory and research perspective. And then by some lucky grace, um, my first job out of school was at an urban design firm that specialized in landscape. And it specialized in working in really remote, really logistically challenging areas. So I suddenly was plucked from you know, Manhattan and going to Central West Africa and Kareas and Croatia and Norman's Key and the islands. And we were setting up nursery infrastructure for these massive urban scale projects where there was none. So working with indigenous communities, working with nursery people, working with um, everyone from the military in Gabon to just, uh, you know, aunties and uncles in Norman's Key and the islands. And it was as soon as I got my hands on plants again, I just like felt my soul return. Um, and it became really clear to me that a lot of my peers in urban centers were suffering from that same dislocation, that lack of sense of place and grounding and connection to the natural rhythms of the world. So my mission just became to scale my, um, at least my personal healing to as many people as possible. And uh, that's how we've approached our installations, is how can we uh, kind of plug back people back into that feeling in the center of a, a city, into um, this feeling, this communion with the natural world. And it was interesting, you said that um the project that we talked about we had in common, which was this, the 14th factory, yeah. the opportunity to approach your practice as an art form, that that was a bit more kind of like liberating as far as the way that you thought about how you could apply what Absolutely. you were doing. Absolutely. I, I set out to create a traditional landscape design firm and then connected with um, Simon Birch, who started the 14th factory, which was here in LA. And he was kind of this crazy artist who, who said, you know, I want to build a garden in this 5,000 square foot gallery. Um, and if you can come up with an idea that I, I like, I'll, I'll give you the room. And we created this lunar landscape um, playing with the idea, um, kind of the terrible idea of terraforming another planet, which in my mind, that, that means that we've destroyed this one and fled our own. So I found that very upsetting and um, created this kind of uh, eerie turf 
um, that was modeled after the topography of Cone Crater, which was the site for the Apollo 14 uh, mission. And we programmed that with people like you who shared their performance art, music, dance. And I really find that catalyst and that um, shift happen for people when they have an emotional connection with the plant life. And for me, I think it's partnering with other artists and creators and layering that planted ecosystem with a cultural ecosystem that kind of just opens up these portals of understanding and education and uh, an emotional connection, which is, for me, what I've observed is when people really change behaviors. So um, that was the first project that set off a light bulb for me of, oh, I can use plant life in a different way, in an unconventional way, and really um, ignite and, and lean into my passion for the arts and design in a different way. That's fantastic. Julia. Yeah, uh, I think for me, um, maybe what I'm drawn to most uh, kind of throughout my work is um, more a conceptual question of how uh, you know, our daily lives and short-term decisions that are made, you know, en masse or individually um, kind of relate to a much longer term, you know, the impacts go on for a long time. And, and sort of thinking about, uh, you know, how short-term decisions that are made, whether, you know, they impact the landscape or design, technology, et cetera, you know, um, what happens, what's next after the design phase and the consumer phase, then what happens to the stuff? Um, and so I'm kind of interested in trying to draw the line between our, our sort of daily experiences and the impacts that will be around for a long time after us. And so... Um, uh, I think that that the works that I'm interested in, that, that the things that I like to make, um, rather than advocate for a specific, um, a specific thing, you know, a specific message, are are kind of more about zooming out a little bit, and right. uh, uh, yeah. And more so thinking uh, longer than just the short term. Like there's a slide I hear of one of the installations you did where you used, I think it was old iPhones to light a lens that shone through to the ceiling and just showing like, this could still be used in a different way, but again, like challenging people to think beyond just the short term of, I got this thing, I'm gonna throw it away and it's for somebody else. Yeah, yeah, in that piece, it's called Burnouts, and uh, there are uh, five iPhones, discarded iPhones, and uh, I found out that the International uh, uh, Astronomical or Astronomy uh, Union, I can't think of what the, the name of the organization is, uh, the organization is but um, every, every now and then they um, retire constellations from star maps because the constellations have become irrelevant to the study of the night sky. Um, and that's usually because of light pollution on Earth, right? The, the, the Earth has gotten so bright that we can't really, um, you know, observe the constellations the way that we once could. Um, and so I thought that it would be, you know, a fitting uh, homage to, to display those uh, constellations using these retired iPhones um, and they're, they're shining light um, through lenses, so they act as video projectors. And, and also, you know, the, the projectors don't have a lot of lumens. You right, know, they're right. not, not very bright. And so I liked the idea that the gallery had to be completely dark to be able to see them. Right. Um, because darkness is not easy to come by, actually. But I think in that, there is a message of just thinking more critically about the environment that we're around, which is kind of a unifying theme amongst all of you, is how can these works inspire more critical thinking, more critical awareness? Um, but with that, how do you measure impact, right? So there's advocacy, there's art, and then there's the education part or like where someone can take something from that. But like, is it measured through audience reaction? Is it, you know, press? Because these, all of these are not things that people would acquire for particularly like a museum or personal collections, right? So the question becomes, 
how do you know it's worked? How do you know it's effective? Like, for each of you, I'm sure there are various metrics, but I'd really love to hear from each of you. Actually, Lily, I'd like to start with you. How do you personally, and then like on a larger scale professionally, measure the impact of the work that you've presented into a space, whether it's short or longer term for that installation? Sure, so our studio really has two different types of projects. One is a permanent landscape project, and then the second one is this botanical art exhibition. So for the permanent landscapes, sure, certainly I feel like the measure, and now more so than ever, is are we making a positive ecological impact? Are, is it through our plant selection, are we creating habitat? I love the milkweed project so much. I mean, why that's so vital is that monarch butterflies will only lay their eggs on those milkweeds. So it's providing an essential ecosystem service. And I think, you know, it's been incredibly liberating and joyful and um, meaningful to design for a more than human audience, you know, not just, and one of the great, um, you know, relationships uh, I'm cultivating with Theodore Payne is making me realize, oh, not only do we need a shift in uh, our plant selection and the choices that we're making, certainly in, you know, Southern California where we're experiencing a st historic drought, I think something interesting and a challenge for artists is how do we shift our perception of beauty? You know, how plants um, look in the summer here, you know, they die back in the same, not all of them, but many of them die back in the same way that we see winter gardens on the East Coast. And Piet Udloff on the East Coast, uh, sorry, not on the East Coast, Piet Udloff, um, a famed uh, landscape architect who's very well known for the High Line, he kind of uh, ushered in this new era of celebrating the beauty of the winter garden. And that is an essential need that we need to create that understanding in Southern California. We wouldn't pipe in hot air to keep our lawns green on the East Coast. That's insane. Just as it's pretty insane that we are, you know, striving for these manicured green gardens in the middle of July in Los Angeles. It doesn't make sense. So I think that's how I'm starting to measure impact for the permanent projects. And then for the botanical art installations, we always think about an exit strategy and we're getting better and better at it. So the plants that you see we always find a second home for them. We find a second life for them, whether it is at a school, a nursing home, um, uh, a community garden, but also we're challenging our partners where possible to create some kind of community impact because you know, we get approached by brands and institutions who want to do something beautiful for their community and have these wonderful values, but if you don't extend that circle of caring beyond whatever the walls of that institution or um, kind of client is, it just, it, something feels dissonant. So, you know, I had a very corporate hotel client last year and we said, you know, we're not going to do this unless we do something that really kind of bleeds out into the community in a positive way. So they donated very significant funds to create an edible teaching garden, to support an edible teaching garden on Governor's Island in New York. We created a school garden in Orlando and then we created conservation houses in Southern California um, for the Mojave Land Trust. So I think it's really n nice to remember that, you know, if you're lucky to, you know, make art or get commissioned by these larger partners, um, at this moment in time, you can, we all can ask and challenge people to uh, go beyond the scope that they've laid out. It's right. the time for it. And so um, we're trying to do that more and more with our partners. Julia, how do you, how do you measure things? Because like the project you're working on with the Space Song, like that's a 200 year sight line. Mm -hmm. What are the metrics for making sure that you do? How do you even change your mind to wrap around a different set of metrics with that? Like, how do you measure impact? Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know if artists are necessarily very good at measuring, <laughs> you know, uh, impacts in terms of metrics, but um, 
Oh, we have a visitor coming. <laughs> um, I, but, you know, I, I also think that it's okay as artists, we live our lives on many scales with many different communities, you know? I mean, I, I am an artist that, you know, I, I like to make work about, about these things and engage in broad conversation uh, with large communities kind of about these things, but I'm also a, a professor and I have relationships with my students and, uh, you know, um, through that context, I think, uh, you know, I can see how action activates uh, people around me, you know. Um, I'm also a mother, I have two small kids, and, you know, on all these different levels, um, we make impacts as people, right? And um, so, I don't know, for me, my, my artistic practice, I think, is kind of just enmeshed with all of those other parts of my self and... Right. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, you take it one day at a time and do what you can within a day and, uh, and yeah, hope, hope the net of that day is good. And that's very fair. I think it's, uh, I think it's also a good thing to note that maybe it's not on the artist to develop the metric. Maybe the metric is in what happens once it's released from the artist's care, but by inviting people into it it gives people the point to have that like flashpoint moment. Elizabeth, a lot of the things that you're doing are about creating those like opportunities for serendipitous collisions and understanding how to look at something in a new way. Is there a more finite way that the NRDC has for measuring impact or is it just as esoteric as an artist's uh, standpoint? I mean, it's, it's interesting because a lot of our projects do really have discrete impact from being able to measure like, you know, how much habitat was created, for example, to, um, you know, th this project, for example, this was a community poster making project where we printed, I think, 4,000 posters over the course of four days and asked people to take them back to the community based on the issue they cared about and use them in kind of their own activism. So we can kind of measure how many people come to something, um, you know, the different communities that we reach in terms of geography, um, if we're thinking about non-humans, you know, the impact that we have. But I actually think that sort of one of the most important forms of impact that we, we can have is, is not knowing where the artist is going to go in the work that we ask them to do with us. Because it becomes too didactic then. And so part of the magic of these projects and what makes them successful is not starting out with a prescriptive formula of what we want someone to do because that doesn't work. Um, I mean, we, as an institution, we have plenty of white papers and legal briefs. If we want to tell you what we think, we will find a way to do that. The, the way you bring an artist in is to sort of lead you on this magical journey. We don't often know what the end point is going to be, what the project is going to be, or what the impact is going to be. And that's the beautiful part of the process. And that's why there's this sort of receptivity that Lily talked about with the viewer when you experience it, because it comes as such a surprise. It comes as such a surprise to learn that an organization like NRDC is working with artists like this. And that's what allows for this open connection to kind of um, move the dialogue forward in new ways and with new people. And I think the word surprise is really good uh, to be an underlying thread for the entire conversation here is the surprise of thinking that things need to be prescriptive, but giving room for surprise to happen for people to come into their own realization of things instead of just parroting other information. Every single one of your practices, and even what we're gonna go into later, is about taking something that you think you know and applying it in a way that maybe you're not supposed to or that is a different way than people are used to. Um, I do have one last question, but I wanna check, how are we for time? Okay, fantastic. So, talking about inviting people in and once you use your medium to bring people into the idea of a message, right? Is there always a clear direct action after engaging with any of the work that either of you do? Or is it supposed to be something that is meant to kind of linger on in the minds and hearts of the people that attend. Again, like Lily, I know that you do the circularity on the back end for you, but is there a direct action that you hope that someone that comes to um, any of your installations to, oh, I thought about this, now I can go and do 
insert this thing. I can go and donate to this particular cause, or I can read up about this, or I can find my local garden. Is there always a direct action after things, or is it really supposed to be leave it open to interpretation? Uh, I mean, we all had a pretty... It's been a very strange few years, and I feel like <laughs> emerging from the lockdown and the pandemic and the mass you know, trauma and disconnection that we've all experienced, it just became really clear when I was coming out of the lockdown to just keep the goals and the vision really simple, which is when you come into our spaces, I just want people to feel a connection to plants and a connection to each other. Like, can we create a feeling of a sense of community um, where people feel like they can be themselves and feel a relationship to, to something larger than themselves? So, I, I mean, that's the large goal. We hopefully, you know, um, are able to hit those notes when we're at our best, um, but just felt a really strong sense of, you know, sense of community and connection. That's, that's what we're trying to do. Elizabeth, is there a call to action for any of the things that you do? Is there ways that you want people to engage with NRDC? Sometimes there's a very specific call to action. Um, this project that keeps popping up with all the bird's eyes um, from Storm King, um, that project happened at the same time that the Trump administration was trying to gut the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So part of the power of the project was showcasing 100 different species of bird's eyes that were in great jeopardy um, if that law was going to be rolled back. It was happening at the same time that NRDC's lawyers were you know, moving forward with litigation to prevent that. So people who came to the exhibit, we use that as an opportunity to teach them about the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and ask them to sort of sign a petition in support of what we are doing. So that had a very kind of discreet measure. Um, there's other impacts that we don't plan for, and one was, I don't have a photo of it here, but uh, we did an exhibition about pet coke, which is a byproduct from oil refining waste. And um, Illinois Senator Dick Durbin used a photograph from this art exhibit on the floor of the Senate when he lobbied against the expansion of the Keystone XL pipeline. And so those are the sort of impacts we want to have that we kind of can't anticipate, but Again, when you have a powerful project that's sort of engaged and open-ended, those sorts of things can kind of grow as part of it and become really important. And when we're talking about tangible things like that, like Julia, you have your book, Was Upgrade, available, right? Is there direct action that you hope that inspires? Is it you know, getting more involved in recycling e-waste? Or is it more just, again, increasing the awareness of this as an option of, there's another way to think about this? Yeah, I think um, I think I am interested always in uh, sort of illuminating the idea that there's another way to think about this for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I. Uh, I'm rarely prescriptive in terms of, um, you know, sort of the direct action that I, I expect uh, or, or hope, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm much more interested in kind of the questions uh, I think that people walk away with. Um, but that said, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I hope that that my work can be part of a larger conversation about design and thinking about, you know, longer term time frames and, uh connecting ourselves to, you know, the future. Well, I hope that this has connected some of you all to maybe questions that you've already had or introduced you to questions that you didn't know that you should be asking. Um, I'd like to thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you so much for indulging my curiosity. I've really um, enjoyed the things that I've learned, but also there's a surprise for everybody here. These plants behind us and this really cool guy that looks like he's lurking. He's actually supposed to be here. Um, <laughs> this is Tarun Nair. Nair? Nair. Nair. Goes by Modern Biology. We're going to ask him some questions. But these plants here were provided uh, courtesy of Lily. So as he's setting up Lily. Theodore Payne. And Theodore Payne. Would you like to talk a little bit about the plants that are here as we're moving this out of the way um, for Tarun to set up? Because I don't know all the names of all the plants. So I'm going to stand back here. Um, 
Can, is that on? There we go. I was like, I don't know the names of all of the plants. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, like I said, these were provided by Theodore Payne, which you've heard me speak about. Incredible resource for native plants. If you are interested in native plants, go visit. Um, Katie brought us here a range. So I think there are seven different species. This is a native oak. Uh, mugwort, which has been known to support lucid dreaming and your dreams. We have manzanitas, mallow, which is an incredible pollinator, a fern that gets to be six feet wide, um, and a native grass. So I am very excited to see what they have to tell us. <laughs> very much so. Uh, here, I'll take that. You want to set that back in there? So this is, you know how, there's, how they say you're not supposed to have like a favorite kid if you're a parent? I've been looking forward to this for oh, at least a month and a half now. Um, you want to set this back up there, Tarun? There you go. So I'd like to welcome Tarun Nair. Goes by Modern Biology. Um, yeah, please. Yes, let's, let's do that part. I'm, I'm the favored child, apparently. There you go. That's great. Um, so let's start with modern uh, biology. Uh, You're a trained biologist that makes music off of plants by biosonifying them, correct? Correct. All yeah. right. I have no idea what that means exactly. <laughs> I just have it in theory. Can you please share a bit more about your practice and what you're doing? Yeah, for sure. So check, check, check. I grew up in... Um, is this mic cutting in and out? Nope, you're good. Oh, I think there's something. I think there's something up with uh, the monitor. Uh, I grew up in Montreal, and um, I grew up playing Indian classical music. But I, if anyone here has Asian parents, I think it's the same across the board. Doing music for a living is not really an option, and so I went into biology, which was my second. There we go, which was my second love, and. Um, I was in a touring band for a long time while being a biologist. Eventually the touring won out. And over the course of the pandemic, uh, I started really engaging with my love of synthesis, sound synthesis and, and nature and biology. And uh, pursuing a kind of line of thought that actually started about 20 years ago, people first started experimenting with the electricity, which is resident in all living things um, and nervous systems, which are not just a human property or an animal property, but which really are a property of all of life. And being able to listen to the burbling of those nervous systems um, through music. So right now we're listening to the gentle electrical burbling of this native mallow plant right here. So if I, if I just unplug for a second uh, and I'll turn it up so you can hear, I'm just gonna unplug. So what I'm doing is sending a small current through this plant, like a imperceptibly small current, but as the electricity in the, in the plant fluctuates, as it's signaling, um, as action potentials are firing, it's triggering note changes in a synthesizer. And so we can sort of listen to the life activity of a plant. So as I plug it in, Mr. Mallow, what do you have for Ms. Mallow? Sounds like a helicopter. It's the weirdest thing. <laughs> that's just that's the native sound of Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's, those are the local birds. Yeah, bird, bird calls of Los Angeles. So, from a very personally nerdy standpoint, biosonifying would be almost the audio equivalent of bioluminescence. Like it's something that already exists within nature, but you found a way to articulate it so we can hear it? Uh, well, biosonifying is what humans do to try to listen to what we can't hear. Right, okay. So bioluminescence is naturally happening, you know, due to this little enzyme in, in you know, phytoplankton and zooplankton. But here, these, although plants do actually make really low and really high frequency sounds to communicate with each other and with the... The, the, the natural environment, we, we can't hear. They're not within our range of hearing. Um, I don't know if any of you saw that article a few years ago about tomato plants screaming yes. when they're low on water. So those are like super high frequency sounds that are beyond our, our hearing range. Here we're turning plant electricity into 
musical notes. Got it, got it, got it. So we're using devices that translate electricity into note changes on a, on a synthesizer. So before we get to my last question, which is about how you run modern biology, we talked about the plants that are here. There are some people that are gear nerds, which Eric record this for Mark. Um, what are you using to create these sounds, synthesize them? Like, what are the devices here for anyone that is curious about how the science and technology part plays with the nature part? Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's such a great question. I think it's I think it's again important to reiterate that um, the you know this mallow plant is not making music. This mallow plant is being a mallow plant. <laughs> Just living. And, and it's so interesting because it ties into this idea of the medium is the message. You know, um, if, if, if any of you have read Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake, he talks about nature being an event. It's not a thing. It's a process that's unfolding constantly. And our bodies are just systems through which matter flows. We're not really matter, we are, we are matter flowing. And in, in the same way, it's like the medium is the message, I think, for, for my particular practice, but the medium also isn't like a static medium. The medium is a process, so it's almost like the process is the message. Um, right. And so, so what I'm doing is taking this, this natural um, process that's happening and running it into uh, running it into this particular device. There are many different solutions, and you can almost do this for free. Um, there's there's ways online that you can build this stuff for like 25 bucks. Mm. Uh, so it's it's definitely very um, you you can connect with this stuff easily. It doesn't have to be. This is a big synthesizer here, but it doesn't have to be this complicated. I just do it because I think it's really cool. Um, but you can make you can make this for much cheaper. I mean, a Moog is cool. Regardless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I have I have stuff that because I'm you know into gear, so I have all of these things. But that's just right. for my own um, you know sort of artistic license. But I have an OP one. I have a, a Chase Bliss Mood. I have a, a Micrograsm Hologram. I have a 606 drum machine. I don't know if we're going to get into that. And then I have this. <laughs> then I have this rig here, a modular synthesizer. Yeah. So the last question before we turn you loose: You run Modern Biology as a nonprofit. You're able to create attention and resources from this. Who are the beneficiaries? Why was it important for you to operate this way? And what do you really hope to impact with the practice that you're in now? I mean, when Lily was talking about connecting with nature, I, re I really resonate with that. Um, I think in terms of hard impact, it would be about protecting wild places. I think there are certain not only is there like important physical diversity in, um, in, in intact ecosystems, which are becoming increasingly rarer, there's also oral, like soundscape diversity, which is disappearing quickly, um, which I'm particularly interested in. And once you lose that, um, it's been shown that it takes, you know, just like the physical diversity, it takes like thousands of years to regenerate. So really what I'm trying to do is, is attract as much attention and awareness as I can to direct towards protecting wild places, because I think that's, that's my own sort of personal thing. So at the moment, I'm, I'm supporting the Indigenous Action Climate Fund. I'm supporting Nature Based Solutions, which is, uh, which is an Indigenous and non-Indigenous sort of partnership in Canada that buys old growth forests and then manages them. Um, and then Rain Coast, which is another sort of uh, preservation um, society in Canada. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. I'm going to get out of the way and let you do your thing here. Thank you so much for sharing. And everyone, modern biology. And then I think after this, are we, are we bringing folks back on stage, or is, is that it? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. 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 Ten minutes and then Q and A. Okay, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna ask for your attention for yeah five seven minutes. I'm not gonna take forever. Um, but I want to start this with a vote. So we have all, all of these beautiful, aside from the rhinoculus, which I don't think are native. Um, everything else here is native. And I'm just, by show of hands, maybe pick your favorite one right now. And by show of hands, we'll decide what to plug into. And then we'll just make a little composition out of that plant. Uh, so we have this deer grass. One person. Three, four people for the deer grass. Okay. We have the mallow, which, let's not include the mallow because we're already listening to him. Um, this fern, native fern. Ooh, lots of fern people. Okay, let's say like 15. 
Uh, we have a, a baby coast live oak. Okay, I think that one just won. Uh, we have a mugwort, which sounds like something from Harry Potter. We, ha we have a lemonade. Oh, thank you, Katie. We have a lemonade berry. I'm like looking at my cheat sheet here. <laughs> we have a lemonade berry, which apparently the berries taste like lemonade. Nobody wants to hear that. Oh, one person in the back. Okay. And then finally, oh, a little manzanita. Okay, Coast Live Oak it is. That's what we're doing. Uh, so I'm going to unplug from these guys here. And so for the next few minutes, maybe we could get into our bodies, um, get out of our rational brains, and just maybe, maybe allow ourselves to drift into a state of consciousness in which we're just like listening to the, the gentle burbles, to all of the traffic, to the native birds of Los Angeles, everything that's happening, just allowing all of it to be a part of this soundscape, which is expressing the, the reality of the present moment. And I'll just, I'll just do some improvisation, and then we'll come back in, in a few minutes and do a question and answer. botanist Monica Gagliano talks about how dangerous this practice is because it decenters humans. It takes us out of the equation for a second to listen to the non-human world. So we can go there too.
I think we have a, a couple minutes. I'd like to do something really sort of fun, just because I, I'm just meeting um, my panel, my fellow panelists for the first time. So if I could ask you all to come, and we're going to try this with you. Yeah, we're going to plug into you and listen to you. So the panelists, if you wouldn't mind joining me for a second. <laughs> yeah, you, you could just, if you, yeah, if you stand right there, um, you're all wearing shoes, which is good. If you're not wearing shoes, it grounds out. Uh, where, where's, where's our other? I'm over here. I'm oh, over yeah. here. You said panelists. Yeah, but you, you, you're the main panelist. I didn't sign the plant waiver. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you have to hold hands. You might want to turn this off. And then you're going to take, yeah. So are you holding the, elect, uh, the, the metal part at the end? What, what do y'all think? If you if you un, if you un if you two unhold hands for a second, it stops, right? <laughs> and then if we take if we let it go for a little bit. Sort of looped their bioelectricity, and then and then I'm just going to do this for a moment. But what I really like to do at this point is Questions <laughs> for our panelists here this afternoon, almost evening. Any questions? I've already asked them. There you go. Oh, you're going? Okay, cool. I thought I was going to have to be everywhere. Hi. Um, so I have a question I'm realizing is pretty similar for both Lily and for modern biology. What is the most surprising thing that plants have taught you that still sticks out to you that has deepened your practice? And to repeat for people that may not have heard, did everybody hear that? Yeah. Okay, never mind. Surprising thing plants have taught you. Is this working? Here, try this one. Got it? Um. I don't know if it's the most surprising lesson that plants have taught me, but the most profound lesson that plants have taught me. A book that many of you might have read in this audience that certainly impacted me very deeply was Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, which so much of um, the lessons from nature, both on a biological level, but uh, certainly when it comes to thinking about the, the larger ecosystem is around reciprocity and this, this experience of uh, exchanging so many of the interconnections between the natural world for, you know, most um, kind of uh, widely spoken about perhaps is the fungi and the microbial networks. And I think that exchange of, you know, nutrients for sugars and that there's these, all these constant um, symbiotic relationships happening, um, you know, some perceptible to us, some not. I think that's something that I always carry with me and I try and bring that and infuse that into the relationships that um, we have with our 
creative collaborators. I think also just the really profound biodiversity is something that is just staggering to me. It's like one of the great mysteries of the world that continues to kind of just spark my imagination time and again. So this idea that there are over 400,000 different species of plants that have evolved over 500, 700 million years and that, you know, we as humans have only really been here for a few hundred thousand years. So being more humble, I think, you know, often how landscape and architecture is taught is really about um, conquering the natural world, taming the natural world, and so really uh, approaching uh, the plant realm with more humility of these being our older brothers and sisters that have something to teach us and that we're actually the new ones to the table, I think has been really helpful in um, our work. Yeah, uh, just playing off that last that last thought. Um, yeah, I, th I think it, it, the idea that um, you know plants are perfectly happy without humans, and yet we would be dead tomorrow without them. So I think that's the, the learning. Other questions, which those are fantastic answers, by the way. I hope. Some of you are taking notes. There will be a quiz later. Francis, you have a question? Hold on. Oh, you have one back there? There you go. Sorry, Francis. Is it, is it, yeah, um, what are your favorite or like the most challenge, favorite or least favorite or like most challenging things about working in Los Angeles or Southern California? If, if you do, I don't know if you all do, but. That might be another Lily question. I mean, depending, I guess, terrain-wise or with the local plants that you're able to utilize and win, are there challenges for what you can work with in Los Angeles or in Southern California? For me? Um, I, I'm pretty new to Los Angeles. I've only, I, I moved here a couple months before the lockdown, so working here is very new. Um, I think one of the challenging things for me is, and it's probably because I'm new, if any of you <laughs> want to come up to me and introduce yourselves, I would love to connect. I'm having a hard time, um, you know, that sense of community that I was speaking about, I found it more challenging. It seems like there's absolutely abundant public space. There are 22,000 vacant lots in LA. There's ample space for, um, urban green space, and yet LA has some of the least urban green space uh, in the country. It's the top five cities that, that lack it. So I find the um, investment in urban green space and then the, how the community uses it, um, I think probably from spending 13 years in New York where everybody is kind of out of their apartments, getting out of their houses, and so many people convene, you know, in the urban parks in New York, um, I'm finding it harder to find that uh, sense of community here. But I strongly believe that is because I'm new here. So I hope I get to meet some of you after this conversation. And if anybody is doing anything interesting, working with public space, plants, um, you know, pollinators, rewilding, I would love to connect because I'm, I'm finding it challenging. I think the only thing, because I, I live and work here as well, the biggest challenge is that? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> it's encouraging more people to walk and encouraging inviting more people into spaces where the programming is not for extroversion but for introversion. So I'm basically on like a small team mission to bring more introverts out of the house. I lure people with books. Occasionally there are foods. But that's really the biggest thing. Other than that, Los Angeles, to Lily's point, is a city that doesn't advertise its history and advertises connections the way that a New York or Chicago would. LA is a city you have to earn 
you have to dig in, you have to go and support the places that you want to be supported by. And if you genuinely support them, you will be embraced and you will be trusted with it. And that's one of the things that's endeared me to remaining here the past 11 years. Julia? What? Oh, yeah, because you're here working at LACMA and JPL. Is there any challenges for you working here? Um, well, is this on? There you go. Um, I am uh, based primarily in Ohio um, and have been working on this project for a number of years uh, with uh, LACMA and um, uh, for a while at the Jet Propulsion Lab. And um, I don't know, for me, uh, an interesting thing about working here has been, uh, you, you know, I mean, I've connected with kind of a specific community here that is interested in working in, uh, you know, these realms of art and technology and art and science. And uh, there's a, a really beautiful long history in this part of the country, um, you know, uh, kind of around that type of work. And, um, so it's been it's been great for me to be able to connect with people who are able to um, recognize kind of the porousness between these realms, I guess. Um, but I'm a you know I'm a visitor. I'm I'm not here full time, so um, uh, I yeah have a different experience, I guess, in that way. And then we have one more behind Francis. Oh, oh, okay, Francis is graciously forfeiting for a second time. There won't be a third. Thank you, Francis. <laughs> you know, Julie, your, your, your work was making me think about the connection between e-waste and industrial design and how you know, good industrial design could really minimize that problem. And I'm just curious in your thoughts about that and whether your work is ever intended to try to spark a connection there and press better industrial design. Could you say that last part again? I couldn't really hear you. Sure, I'm sorry. Whether your work has ever intended to um, push for better industrial design and to sort of wake up the people who are making this stuff to the possibilities for minimizing this problem. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that part of the conversation is really important, right? Because uh, the way design works really uh, in our current sort of uh, consumer paradigm, um, you know, uh, corporations are in charge of the design and then the consumer really is in charge of the cleanup. You know, there isn't a lot of responsibility on the, on the um, corporate side uh, for the, the trash collection and, and processing of, um, you know, uh, cons electronics or, or landscape, you know, old buildings that, that fall apart, Walmarts or whatever, you know, are not, uh, Walmarts not responsible necessarily for cleaning them up afterwards. And so I think that, um, you know, uh, good design practices have to be part of the uh, equation, you know, starting, starting from the beginning, um, thinking about long-term uh, use of, uh, you know, technology, objects, buildings, spaces, uh, et cetera. Um, you know, if it's not reuse, is it uh, recycling? Is it reprocessing? Does it go back to the earth? Uh, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I'm very much interested in thinking about that. And, and with the work uh, at JPL, you know, when I began uh, having a conversation about a specific spacecraft, it, it was a conceptual spacecraft, is a, spe uh, a spacecraft that... Uh, was intended, the idea is it would travel 4.2 light years away over, you know, 42 years um, and uh, would have to perform operations that were so distinct from, you know, over the course of that time that it would actually have to transform. The spacecraft mm. itself would have to become a new spacecraft throughout the mission. And um, I thought that this was just such a great design challenge um, to think about applying to our terrestrial, uh, you know, operations as well. You know, if we can design a thing 
that's going to go light years away and turn into something new over the course of years. And, and we can, we can do this, you know. Um, why are we not thinking this way about things that we design around us? And uh, so, yeah, I'm, I, I am interested in that conversation, uh, you know, in the design realm. Uh, yeah, I mean, we talk about planned obsolescence, so why not talk about planned reuse? Yeah, selescence, exactly. <laughs> but it's a bit of a ship of Theseus kind of experiment where it's like it needs to be replaced consistently, then it's a new thing. Um, we have room for one last question. I think we're at the one minute mark, right? Okay, one last question. Francis, do you want to offer? Yes, this Gilgam here in the front. Just making sure. This question is for Lily. I, I, like many people during the pandemic, started my own garden, which was the first time I'd ever done it. It sort of changed my relationship with food and my yard and everything. And I think at that time I discovered you and your Freedom Gardens initiative. And I was just wondering if, if you could speak about that and also is it still ongoing? Yeah, so um, I had the same experience during the lockdown. I'd been working with plants for over a decade and creating this large-scale botanical art that's at the core of our practice. And then literally over a course of 72 hours, I had five or six major projects cancel. You know, it's everything was postponed like so many of us. And then suddenly my biggest project became these four-by-four projects four, uh, raised beds in my backyard. And it was really uh, disorienting and strange because I was geared up to travel all, all around the world and build these big installations. And then suddenly to realize like I hadn't grown food since I was a child with my parents. And I had no understanding of this essential part of the plant world. And that's when I hired Shannon Lai, who's my project manager now. And she managed the Brooklyn Grange for five years and has just been this enormous um, breath of fresh air and inspiration in our studio practice. And we spent many months just creating um, free resources and education. We really shifted what our studio was doing. Obviously, we had n n no real commissioned work, and it was how can we be of service? And so many people were experiencing food instability. It felt like incredibly scary to go to the market at that time. And so we thought the best thing that we could do was to provide lessons, forums, education for people to start growing their own food. And we started having, you know, a whole group of people growing food along with us. And I found the people in the food community, I mean, Ron Finley is here, who's just an absolute legend. Um, I'm not sure if he's, he's still here, but he, he he's kind of um, transformed how LA really connects with food in so many ways by planting uh, fruit trees and vegetables in his own front and backyard. He got policy change on an urban scale. Now it was illegal to grow food um, in Los Angeles public spaces, which is, which is wild. so wild yeah. given that, you know, close to 30% by some measures of Angelinos experience food insecurity. So um, I was like really amazed at how embraced my team was and how supported we were by people who have been working in the urban agriculture and food justice space for so many years. And so um, we've now embedded a lot of the principles and design ideas that we developed throughout Freedom Gardens into our installation and design work. And I hope to continue to do that and expand that. We're building two um, pretty ambitious proposals right now that have to do with with urban agriculture and food security, but we've stopped providing the education and Freedom Gardens uh, support because now we're busy doing our installation work again. But I would love to return to that because it was so um, it was so rewarding. So thanks for bringing that up. That is our time. We'd like to thank you all for your time being out here, being outside. It's been fantastic to hear all of these stories. The way that you found out about this, please continue to support MOCA and their efforts. Please follow the works of my colleagues here. So Elizabeth Kaur, Lily Kwong, Julia Christensen, Taru Nair. I'm Jason E.C. Wright. Thank you to Livia and Francis. Thank you to Alex here at the MOCA. Um, 
A lot of Thank good things you. to happen in Los Angeles. Dig in. There's more talks in this series, but continue to support your local art space and follow these stories, follow these individuals that are up here because the change starts here. And if you want to do something that has a message, find the medium you're working in and see how you can do it there. Thank you all. Have a good evening. <laughs>